Welcome to Live Wire Markets and our listed series for 2024. Today I have the pleasure of being joined by Fred Pollock, the Chief Investment Officer at GCM Grosvenor and Portfolio Manager of the Pangana Private Equity Trust Fund. Fred, great to see you there in Chicago. Thanks for joining us. Great. Thank you very much for having me, Hans. It's funny, Fred, because the last, the last time we spoke was actually 12 months ago for, for this series, so it's good to see you again. But a lot has happened in that time, right? I mean, we've had the collapse of SVB and Credit Suisse. We've had this huge boom in AI interest, two global wars now, just to name a few. So how do you find, how has the role of private equity in an investor's portfolio changed over the last year? And how has it stayed the same? Yeah, it's a good question. I think the answer is actually it hasn't changed that much. I, we view it as a core allocation. We view, you know, the private markets are, are as big, if not bigger than the public markets now and a lot of institutional investor portfolios. You're still going through a process of the individual investor or the retail investor building up private equity allocations in their portfolio, but it's very early days, meaning it's very kind of small percentages. And none of those basic, you know, kind of fact patterns have changed much. The biggest thing, obviously, is the, the increase in interest rates, which has changed the dynamics of private equity, which I'm sure we'll get into you know, in this conversation. Yeah, no, absolutely. The one other huge change, of course, has been the, the repricing of rate expectations. And, and the day we're taping this interview, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve has just handed down its, its latest decision. And we've seen this repricing of rate expectations from none to six rate cuts to, you know, now we're looking at two to three. So what effect, if any, does expected rate cuts have on your investing process? Yeah, I mean, the going from a zero interest rate regime to, you know, let's call it positive interest rate regime, three, four percent, kind of typically speaking on the 10 year in the U.S. is a, is a good, you know, kind of guess. Um, that really doesn't change much in private equity. So if you think about private equity, the industry grew quite successfully in the late 70s and early 80s. Interest rates were in the double digits, you know, at that point in time. And it, it was really about control and driving cash flows and the enterprises. I'll, the, the thing I'll say is, uh, you know, with interest rates coming back down into that range, if people I think think they're going to stabilize that three to four percent range over a period of time, you sort of see that in the 10 year. It's very comfortable. It does mean that we need to drive more value, though, through the portfolio companies, through the management of the companies and growth, as opposed to, I think, a little bit of financial engineering crept into the private equity space over the last 10 years, just when rates were zero. You know, there are people who you could buy something, not really do that much to it. Interest rates went down and then maybe sell it for a larger multiple. That sort of game is over. It really wasn't something we were doing a lot of to begin with. We were beneficiaries, of course, if rates went down. But, um, you know, you're just back to the normal bread and butter practices in private equity as a result. Okay, fair enough. Um, I was interested to read through some of the, the fund's recent documentation. I know that you've been spotlighting some recent investments in, in, in the industrials, the healthcare, even the insurance spaces. Does that suggest that in terms of the mix of the portfolio companies, you're maybe more after defense rather than offense at the moment? Yeah, I mean, it's a fair question. There's, we have been for, and if I'm, I'll, I'll admit for too long and probably too early, a little bit concerned about where we are in the cycle from an economic perspective. And so, you know, for the last year or two, as you kind of astutely observed in our, in our file, you'll see we've really moved away from, you know, investments that we think are um, too sensitive to the economic cycle being kind of prosperous and there being high growth over that period of time. I, it's not a forecast. We have no idea if I knew exactly what the economy is going to do. You know, that would be great. We don't know exactly what it will do. But it does feel like we're kind of closer to the end of a cycle rather than the beginning. When you think about private equity being kind of a seven year, eight year hold in an investment, it's hard to envision us not enduring some sort of downturn over the next seven or eight years. And so we've been shying away from those assets that wouldn't perform well during that period, which is exactly what you're saying. We've been driven us to things like industrials and defensives and those types of investments, which we think will perform well, even if you do have some economic issues over the course of the hold. Yeah, no, absolutely. So given the slowing growth backdrop we are now seeing in, in, in most developed economies and by the US actually, it, it needs to be said, where are you finding the most opportunities from a geographical standpoint? Yeah, I mean, the, our biggest area of investment has always been and continues to be the US. That's the deepest private equity market. It's in those sectors that you, that you mentioned kind of where the focus is. Europe's also interesting. So there's some value opportunities starting to appear in Europe where because the economy has been slow, because the economy, you know, kind of growth has been more affected. Plus, there's obviously some issues relating to geopolitical tensions and other things. There's been opportunity in the private equity space, and we're seeing an increased percentage of our deal flow actually coming out of Europe 
uh, you know, versus the other markets. And then Asia is behind that in a little bit of a more limited way. We're obviously not big investors in places like China, but things like Japan, for example, are becoming attractive. So, you know, we're, we're obviously we've been participants in those markets for for decades. And it's it's interesting and nice to see them starting to contribute in terms of deal flow. And just to follow up on the Japan thing, is that for the same reason that people have become really interested in public markets in Japan, those regulatory changes? Yeah, I think it is basically. So from a private equity perspective, at least historically speaking, it was hard to do control transactions in Japan. It was just it just was as a, you know, kind of a private equity sponsor, whether you were domestically based or not. I mean, you could be a Japanese based private equity sponsor and still have difficulty doing it. The regulatory changes that are in the public markets and everyone sees that are sort of allowing corporate governance reforms and allowing for more reform of the way the companies are managed uh, is seeping into the private space too. And I expect over the next decade, you'll see many more private equity transactions as a result. If you think of the size of that economy, it really should have a lot more um, of a kind of a, a percentage of the flow of private equity transactions than it does. And uh, I think that might, you know, that gap might close over this next period. I'm, I wouldn't bet on it all happening quickly, but I think if you look forward, you know, 10 years, you would see a lot more transactions. And so we want to be participants in those. Yeah, no, absolutely. So obviously you play in private businesses. It's in the name, everybody, private equity. Um, but I, I want to spotlight something that I think you, you and the team wrote in a, in a recent, uh, recent market update, actually, because one that you did invest in, one of those private businesses that you invested in, that has since gone public, I think is Instacart, if I'm not mistaken, now up something in the neighborhood of 20% since its IPO. I'm curious, what, what lessons did you learn from that case study and from that particular experience? Yeah, I mean, that's been an interesting one. So that would be, it actually represents kind of the minority of our activity. So most of our investing are in kind of uh, very mature, stable, low growth enterprises, to be honest, you know, where, where there's opportunity operationally to sort of improve the management, maybe improve the margins or the sales growth profile. Instacart was very different, which is that was more of a growth investment, meaning it was, um, it was clearly needed capital to pursue its business plan, but at the time that we invested, it was kind of um, pre-break even, even you know, sort of not producing cash flows. And since then, you know, now it's on track to produce probably a billion dollars worth of EBITDA and cash flow per annum. You know, it's on a good path. It's producing cash flow. It's you know, it's kind of doing this. Thing. It's gotten public. Uh, I'll tell you, it experienced the real ups and downs of the growth market. So during COVID, you know, people were trading small fractions of that enterprise in the private market at what I think were very high valuations, you know, very, very high multiples. And then when it went public, it went public into a market that really was trading them at very low multiples. And, you know, our journey there has been pretty good. We actually made a profit. It's been a kind of a good investment over that period. But my suspicion is it'll be the next couple of years that it decide kind of the fate of those types of investments. And as long as they deliver on the cash flows and the business plan, I think it'll it'll be, you know, you'll, it'll be fine over time to see the value come out of those types of positions, which is good. All right, well, that's good to hear. So the other thing I've been reading in some of your recent documentation is that uh, you've also noted that a falling Australian dollar might have actually hampered returns. So I'm curious, are you able to hedge against the falling currency or, or a stronger US dollar should values continue to decrease? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's actually kind of the other way around for the trust typically because it's now fully invested. So it, it depends on sure. where it was in its life. Early in its life, it was sort of, it was largely uninvested and it was cash. And now that it's fully invested, it mostly owns U.S. dollar or Europe, euro assets, right, if you kind of think of the trust. And so, you know, when the dollar is stronger, the euro is strong versus the Aussie dollar has actually helped returns over the last year or so. And we can hedge. We've partially hedged sometimes the cash component, which was what gave us trouble in the past, meaning if we hold Aussie dollars in cash or, US, you know, we can hedge the cash. Component. But we don't hedge the value of the enterprises just because I think it's, a, it's almost like a doubling up of the risk for people. I think when the markets are good, uh, and the asset values, generally speaking, are accreting. The Aussie currencies also tends to be pretty good. You know, it's kind of core, and there's a bit of an inverse correlation when things are difficult. And so I think our fear with hedging is that we wouldn't be helping people. And then we allow, obviously, investors can then hedge in their own portfolios, you know, in terms of the way that they handle currency. So, you know, we decided not to not to hedge it. But it's it's just one of the risks of the trust. That's obviously disclosed that it's unhedged and, and you own U.S. dollar and European assets. Yeah, no. And of course, it is something that every investor should be uh, should be considering in their investing journey before they, you know, take any trade. Just finally, on the returns conversation, obviously, been fairly strong since inception. There, nearly 10% per annum, you know, on, on on average over the life of the the trust. 
How do you expect that return profile to fare for the rest of 2024? And I know you've alluded to it a little bit already there, but, but how do you expect the return profile to kind of evolve going forward? Yeah, it's interesting. So if you looked at the trust, obviously the trust started as a cash box, right? Because it you know went on market and had cash, not assets. The assets have actually performed at about 18% per annum. So the, you know, the invested dollars have been generating rates of return in kind of the high teens, which is good. And then you, know, you average that together with cash that was earning zero, essentially, and, and you kind of get the 10 that you've seen in the trust over that period of time. I think because rates went up, Return expectations in all the different categories went up by three or four percent. And and I think that's a reasonable expectation for the kind of forward rates of return, which is that we deliver on invested capital probably three or four percent more than we otherwise would. We historically have told people that we try and generate mid teens return. So my guess is now high teens type return on the invested assets is a good guess. And then you just have to net off obviously the costs and, and fees and everything else associated with the trust. And then, you know, our 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 hope for the trust over time is that we sort of deliver the 4% yield that the trust has, and then also deliver kind of an eight or 9% capital return in, in addition to that, you know, so you get kind of low teens total return, that way that it kind of doubles every seven or eight years in terms of the NAV, while also delivering the yield is kind of our objective. And at this environment, it's easier to do it than it has been in the past, obviously. It's easier to do that in a world where interest rates and money cost 4% than when it costs zero. And so, you know, I feel a little more confident that we can deliver on those things in this kind of environment. Right. Some great insights there. Fred Pollock, thanks for joining us from GCM Grosvenor and Pangana. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed that conversation, please subscribe to the Livewire Market Index websites as well as our YouTube channel where you can catch up with the rest of the listed series. Thanks for watching.